Well, okay, I'm getting the signal to get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Seeley. I'm the president of the Health First Foundation. And I'd just like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of you for joining us here today. We are really honored that you took the time out of your day to participate in this important conversation. And I hope the information that we share today will be beneficial for you and your family. As you can see, I have my mask on, but since I'm in a room by myself and uh, maintaining social distancing, I'm gonna take it off so you can hear me better. And, uh, and Dr. Laird can confirm or deny if my cooties will be transmitted over the, uh, the WebEx conference call, but I think you're all gonna be safe. Um, first of all, let me start by apologizing for the uh, confusion with the link. I hope that, well, if you're seeing me, you made it onto this new link, but there was uh, a WebEx update that was uh, just issued earlier and it caused some technical difficulties for us. So that's why we uh, are starting a little bit late. Um, we endeavor to adhere to the 1 p.m. conclusion of this, but um, if questions are coming in, we can certainly extend or we can um, you know, follow up offline with other questions. So, um, uh, so with that, um, let me just cover a little housekeeping. All viewers are muted to assist with the audio on our side and also your video is turned off. So we and other viewers can't see you, but hopefully you can see us. Um, we'll be taking questions during the conversation, so feel, feel free to participate by clicking the arrow button next Q&A on the right side of your screen. Just type in your question, um, at the bottom. and with all that, let's get started. Um, you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, we all know that this has been a really challenging year um, so far, and so there's no way to predict what the future will hold. But since it's our mission to improve the wellness and health of those who serve, we wanted to give you an exclusive opportunity to learn more about COVID-19 from one of our most experienced medical experts, Dr. Timothy Laird, um, who's with us today. He's the Associate Chief Medical Officer for the Health First Medical Group, and really one of the smartest and nicest docs that you're ever gonna meet. So thanks for joining us here, um, Dr. Laird. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And, and I'm I'm also in a room by myself, so just so that you can hear me, I'll take take my mask off too. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. This is such obviously an important topic and it's an honor to be here and talk to talk to all of our guests. Well, we're thrilled that you're here. And before we get started, would you just kind of give us a little background about yourself and your, you know, kind of unique experiences that have brought you to this point in your career? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I uh, grew up in Topeka, Kansas, uh, uh, son of a politician. <laughs> my dad was in the Kansas house for many years, and uh, my mom's a nurse. I uh, had uh, three brothers, um, and um, uh, I was lucky enough in med school to meet the smartest girl in the class, and so uh, uh, we have, uh, we got married and have four kids. Uh, one uh, who, uh, oldest, is a uh, 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 graduate of West Point and is now serving all of us at, as a, a screaming eagle at the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, I've got and his uh, little sister is just starting medical school. Her little sister is finishing up undergrad. And uh, then her little sister is uh, here at uh, MCC just finishing up high school. So, um, I've been in, interested in infectious disease since spending some time in Micronesia during my residency. I, I was with the Army and, um, and got some infectious disease uh, uh, experience and um, was uh, lucky enough then to make it to Melbourne uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, where I've been with Health First ever since and um, uh, practice family practice up in Vieira and, and do some uh, associate chief medical officer uh, work with the group too. Well, we uh, both thank you and your family for your service, but also for bringing your um, unique set of um, experiences to, you know, to bear here in this current pandemic. I mean, I just sort of wonder if at any point in your training, you'd be facing a pandemic. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, something you, we all studied about the 1918 pandemic and uh, kind of, you know, with 100 years having elapsed, I think we kind of assumed maybe that uh, it wasn't going to come back, or if it would, it'd be very easy to, to control. And it's very humbling to see that, uh, as Dr. Fauci told us all early in this, uh, the virus is in control, we aren't. Um, and that's, that's been, that truth has been borne out uh, on more than one occasion as, as this, this whole pandemic has elapsed. Nevertheless, we, I've been very uh, 
uh, happy as part of the Health First Coronavirus Task Force to to see the talent that 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 has been brought to bear from uh, from our staff and our medical colleagues on um, helping us all uh, uh, you know approach this pandemic as successfully as we can. We appreciate that, and we appreciate your steady hand on the wheel, um, and um, you know, and an approach to treating uh, COVID nineteen, and you know, and and other illnesses. I mean, people are sick with other things here in Brevard also. So, uh, it's been an interesting time. So, um, there are some questions. Um, I think a couple of these are pre-populated, but we're getting some questions coming in from the viewers. And so, let's just kind of start with some, I guess, general context. So, you know, or the basics. So, since COVID nineteen is a virus. Um, and that's the V in COVID, right? Um, can you explain the difference between a virus and a bacteria and how each are approached by physicians? Yeah, that that's crucial. Um, so um, not to insult anybody's intelligence, but I think it is crucial to explore the differences because of what you said about how differently they are approached. Um, so most of us are more familiar with bacterial infections. I mean, there's basically three different types of infections, bacterial, viral, and fungal. I uh, won't talk about fungal, mostly involve the skin, but, um, but bacteria are cells that are alive. And they have um, cell membranes that are different from our cells. And so it's easy for us to, when we make antibiotics, to exploit the differences in the cell wall or the DNA or the RNA of the cell between bacterial cells and human cells. And that's how antibiotics work, is they destroy a bacterial cell membrane or they destroy something unique to a bacteria leaving our cells untouched. And so that's when we get a bladder infection or a skin infection or a, a you know, strep throat. Well, antibiotics are pretty successful in killing bacteria. Viruses, on the other hand, are kind of like a Trojan horse. Uh, they are not really living they instead insert themselves into our cells uh, and take over our cellular machinery and cause it to do weird stuff. So if it's a virus on our skin, it overproduces skin cells and we call that a wart. If it's a, uh, if it's a rhinovirus, it attaches to our nasal cells and makes them overproduce mucus, and we call that a cold. And various other viruses, and there's serious viruses. I mean, you know, there's uh, uh, measles and chickenpox and viral meningitis and, and, and all that sort of thing. And so we can't really kill the virus since it's not alive anyway. It's, it's inside our cells. Um, and so destroying viruses involves destroying our own cells. So that gets trickier. Antibiotics don't work. And so as of 2020, our best strategy against viruses is don't get them. And uh, prevention, prevention worth a pound of cure sort of thing. And the main way to not get viruses is vaccination. That's why all of us had polio vaccination and measles and mumps and chicken pox and all those sorts of um, uh, vaccinations so we didn't get viruses. Because once we get those, anybody who's ever gone to the doctor for shingles or um, uh, any of the other viral infections has probably left fairly disappointed because there's not a lot of great treatments that we have. Um, and so that comes to bear really well with COVID is if you understand it is a virus, it's one to be avoided. It explains why our treatments aren't great and why um, we emphasize prevention so much. Well, so that's all really interesting. So then how does all that affect how we 
treat coronavirus, right? I mean, what what are well anyway? I mean, yeah. How does that affect what we do? So you probably, if you watch the news or read the newspaper, you see uh, the, it seems like there's the latest theory every week as to a various treatment. Uh, first, they thought that hydroxychloroquine might work because some of the damage from coronavirus does appear to be a an immune response that may go in an overdrive and hydroxychloroquine can make your immune system not go in overdrive. However, that has been well studied and has been found to not be helpful. Um, and so there's a drug called remdesivir, which um, it has, is approved uh, for use with this. Um, there are some studies that say it uh, works to a certain extent, uh, it's not great, like every virus that we have, uh, or every treatment for viruses. No, no treatment for viruses works great. Um, and so you may have seen recently the whole uh, convalescent plasma uh, 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 suggestion, and it, it had some approval by FDA recently. And we've been using that at Health First since um, since almost the beginning. Um, and the idea there is we get the antibody-laden plasma from somebody who's the disease, give it to somebody who is struggling with the disease, and so they might um, benefit from being able to fight off the disease faster. It's almost like kind of an instantaneous vaccine. I mean, that's why we're all going to get our vaccine in February or whenever it comes out, um, so that we will have our own convalescent plasma without having to get the disease. Well, right now, uh, to help people before vaccination becomes uh, available and people who are struggling with the disease, we are able to give them antibodies from someone else. Um, again, very new disease, very new research, unclear how useful it is. There are anecdotal reports. Today's newspaper you probably saw has a has a success story from uh, from somebody who uh, who got that treatment. Um, but um, those, are the, those are the kinds of treatments you're seeing. You're not going to see a magic bullet. We don't have any magic bullets for any viral disease on Earth. So um, hence the the emphasis on prevention and vaccination. And so, in that patient that's in the uh, paper today, that he he was treated at uh, our own Cape Canaveral Hospital, if I'm not mistaken, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've used uh, convalescent plasma, um, I, I believe, in all of our facilities, um, and um, so we're hopeful that that'll give people uh, a fighting chance, and that when long-term studies are back, they will show that 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 was. Uh, uh, was uh, useful uh, and because convalescent plasma has been used in other diseases, other viral diseases, and so that's not a um, a stretch to think that 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 will that would work. It's very interesting. So I mean, there's so much information out there, and there's you know, so many sources of information. So how are you and the physicians um, at Health First keeping up with these rapidly changing virus uh, with the rapidly changing virus and the knowledge of treatments? <sighs> Yeah, so we have a, a very talented infectious disease team um, led by Dr. Anthony Barilli, who is uh, a very uh, intelligent infectious disease doctor who's been really helping kind of uh, oversee all of our uh, uh, COVID uh, treatments and, and uh, strategies. Uh, he uh, spent time in the Navy. He was the head infectious disease doctor on the U.S. Naval Ship Comfort. Uh, he's trained at, at uh, the various military infectious disease uh, schools and facilities, um, and so he uh, he stay amazing. He's there's not an article written about COVID that he's not that hasn't read and and, uh, and digested and critiqued by the next morning, um, and so he. Uh, helps uh, Dr. Stallnaker, our chief uh, physician executive here at Health First, and a team that they have 
um, uh, decide how we at Health First are going to optimally bring, you know, the world's research to our patients in Brevard County. Um, the, uh, as far as staying on top of it in general, I have to say the internet has been amazingly helpful from the early days uh, of COVID. The doctors in Wuhan, China, uh, the doctors in Hong Kong, uh, the doctors in Italy, Northern Italy at the beginning, uh, were sending out um, uh, information about what they were seeing, treatments they were trying. And there are, um, there are various websites that doctors use to keep in touch. There's one, <laughs> there's kind of a, a Facebook for doctors. It's, it's called Doximity. And uh, we have to be careful because it's not peer reviewed. And, um, you, you know, anecdotal reports are just that they, you got to, as a doctor, you're, you're trained not to put too much faith into just one person's opinion. Uh, however, when you've never seen a pandemic before and, and you do kind of want to not uh, make the same mistakes that other docs did. So they were very, forthright um, in uh, early March and saying, here's what we're seeing, here's what we tried, here's what did work, here's what didn't work, um, here's what you might expect. For example, um, one of the weird things on this uh, virus is it tends to cause your body to clot, your blood to clot. We didn't know that. That's, that's not normal with viral infections. And yet people were surviving the virus, but then having blood clots in their lungs or having strokes or having blood clots in their legs. Uh, nobody knew to look for that, but the doctors who were seeing it in Asia and Europe kind of tipped us off. And so fairly early in the, uh, 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 our cases here in Brevard County, uh, we started giving uh, small doses of blood thinners prophylactically to our COVID patients so that they wouldn't clot. Um, and it works. Um, you know, we do that anyway for people who are undergoing surgery or people who may be um, actually most of our hospitalized patients in general so that they don't get blood clots in their legs while they're laying in beds. We give them prophylactic doses of anticoagulants. So we started doing that with uh, coronavirus. And that was, you know, there were no long term studies that told us that. That was our colleagues around the world who alerted us to that. So to answer your question, um, the world is smaller now as far as transmission of medical information. You don't have to wait for it to get into the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, as long as you mind your P's and Q's and pay attention and make sure that you don't overreact to anecdotal reports, there's some good information you can get from uh, colleagues around the world. What good advice that is generally not to overreact anecdotal reports. I think that's really great and really interesting. So talk a little bit about, you know, kind of your current clinical experience. What kinds of symptoms are your patients seeing now? And is there a difference between the symptoms that kids and adults are experiencing? Yeah, it's uh, kids typically, as we've seen on the news, have milder uh, symptoms, sometimes none. Uh, there's been a handful of adults who don't ha haven't ha even had uh, many symptoms to speak up. So I'll, I'll speak in generalizations. In general, uh, you get exposed to somebody um, probably who, who wasn't wearing a mask. You weren't wearing a mask uh, for two days. And again, don't hold me to this broad generalizations, but for a few days, you feel perfectly fine while you are spreading the disease to your loved ones and friends. And then maybe day uh, three, four, five, six, you start to have uh, a fever, low-grade fever. Uh, uh, 100.4 is kind of the cutoff if you have a home thermometer. We don't call 99 a fever. Uh, 100.4. Uh, is a fever. So you get a little fever, maybe you feel a little achy, maybe your throat scratchy. Um, and uh, pretty soon, you know, it's the real deal. Your muscles start hurting. A headache is prominent. 
uh, within a few days, you may or may not notice you can't smell or taste anything. That's not everybody, but that's fairly unusual uh, in, a, in, a, in that a lot of viruses don't do that. This virus often does. Um, and then uh, you're sick for a good seven, 10 days and you, by the way, at any point in that, you might start getting better depending on your age and other sicknesses you have. Um, unfortunately, some people start to get better. They think they're over the worst of it. And then the shortness of breath just hits them. And the shortness of breath comes on fast, cough, uh, feels like you're you know, struggling to breathe. and most people can stay at home and treat themselves um, uh, uh, conservatively with fluids and rest and Tylenol for the headache and muscle aches and fever. But the shortness of breath, if it's severe, that's the one thing that sends you to the hospital. And so we tell our patients, um, you know, if you've got the symptoms, the most important thing is sequester yourself, isolate yourself, have your family call anybody you've been around, uh, do your own kind of contact tracing, uh, figure out who you've been around for the last three days, tell them they very well may have been exposed, uh, and then treat yourself with massive fluids, good nutrition, uh, Tylenol, uh, just up to the maximum on the box. Read the read the box on the maximum dose. It depends on the type and milligrams of Tylenol that you have at home. Uh, but treat your symptoms and realize that you're probably going to do fine. The vast majority of patients, even older, even people with other comorbidities, we call them, other diseases, the vast majority do okay at home being treating themselves, um, have people have, if you have family members, have them bring you your meals, but stay away. Um, and we've got to keep people from, from spreading this. And that's the only way this is going to go away and we're going to be able to reopen our country. So, so, but I, I don't want people to panic if they get the disease, chances are they will recover. Um, and if their shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, things like that are bad. Go to the hospital. They'll care for you. You, uh, They'll do an excellent job they, and uh, they'll care for you safely. And the vast majority of people go home. Thank you. That's uh, very helpful. As a hypochondriac, whenever you go over the symptoms, I, I get all of them as you're saying them. So I think I may need a test when I'm done here, but um, no, I, so uh, just so to reiterate, and you touched on mitigation, I think a little bit when you're talking about the differences between virus, viruses and bacteria. But you know, under the heading of mitigate, uh, mitigating the uh, spread of the disease, and to kind of reiterate what we've heard, hopefully, please explain why it's important to wear face masks when social distancing is impossible. Yeah. So the. Um, uh, because we don't have great treatments for viruses, number one. And number two, because this virus is fairly contagious, like most viruses are. Um, and number three, what really hurts about this virus is that it's contagious before, while you're feeling well. Some viruses make you sick the first few hours. And so there's not that asymptomatic spreading phase. This one, you are asymptomatic for several days, uh, infecting people potentially while you feel perfectly fine. And that's why these viral infections uh, only go away once people stop spreading them to other people. And, and there's a condition uh, or there's a statistical um, term called the R not. Um, it's it's an R with a zero by it, and in t and that means how many people on average does a sick person spread the disease to? And 
until that number is less than one. So if you get the disease, you spread it to one or zero people. Uh, until that number is less than one, the disease just continues to spread exponentially throughout the community. And um, so uh, that's why masking, we all know how we spread colds and flus and things like that. It, it, washing hands, not sharing utensils, wearing a mask so any of the um, particles that are coming out of your body aren't spread to anybody else, um, keeping your distance. Um, is it six feet? We're not sure. I mean, whether it's six feet, 10 feet, three feet, the bottom line is there is enough evidence that our respiratory droplets spread at least three feet. And of course, anybody who's ever um, spent any time in a room with somebody else knows that there's, there's wafting um, particles throughout the room. Um, those are all just good habits for us all to do. And if you're feeling well today, you may be spreading coronavirus. That's the, the message as don't go by how you're feeling. Uh, all, uh, so many of these cases were spread by somebody who was feeling perfectly fine that day. Two days later, they got the fever. Uh, and uh, by then it was too late, they'd already spread it. So that's, that's the importance of masking, washing hands, keeping distances is just to try and keep all of our fellow neighbors and friends safe. So then kind of related to that, are asymptomatic people just as contagious as those uh, people showing symptoms? Yeah, just as contagious, maybe not. Because I mean, somebody who's coughing and hacking and things like that probably is more contagious. But um, asymptomatic people with the virus are still contagious. It's interesting. So then if someone is symptomatic, and then they test positive, uh, when do you suggest they be tested for antibiotics? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, don't check for antibodies within two weeks because it takes your body at least two weeks to even produce the antibodies. The other thing is realize that the antibody test is not that helpful. It, it's not going to help your doctors. It's not going to help uh, your treatment because you'll be basically over it by then. Um, it's interesting to know if you have antibodies, it confirms that you had coronavirus. Uh, the most important part of getting antibodies, uh, you know, I would like to tell everybody, if you get antibody tested, go over to the blood bank and donate your plasma. You know, that's really the only value of finding out if you have antibodies is you're one of the people who can help your neighbors with your, com with uh, making convalescent plasma out of your blood. So uh, antibody testing is interesting for the epidemiologists and the public health department and for you. Uh, it's not that useful for the doctors. That's very interesting. So then kind of related to that further stream, can you get reinfected with COVID-19 after recovery? And <laughs> if it's worth this, worth the second time, right? I mean, there's a recent study out of somewhere right we're hong kong yeah so there was there was somebody in uh, there was a study a few months ago actually in south korea where they they claimed to have a few people who'd gotten it twice and then one of the sailors on that aircraft carrier in guam uh i think it was just one uh had tested negative after he recovered and then tested positive later uh so they think he might uh have uh, well, was the negative test a false negative or did he really get reinfected? We're not sure. And now they're like you allude to, uh, Hong Kong has some literature now of somebody who got reinfected. Wouldn't be the first time. I mean, people get viral infections more than once. Um, it's concerning because we are hoping that after you get the disease, uh, many viral diseases you don't get twice. Um, uh, and so we are hoping that that's a rarity or who knows, maybe it's a lab error that they really never cleared the first infection. Uh, but 
it's a little concerning as far as vaccination goes, uh, because we're giving you uh, eventually once it comes out, we would be giving parts of the virus uh, to induce immunity. And if that's not going to, you know, uh, result in you not getting the illness or at least getting a mitigated case of the illness, that's concerning. So er, that's being watched closely. Um, are children less likely to catch COVID-19? That's a question that we hear a lot about now, particularly with schools reopening, right? Yeah, that's that, that was the thought early on is that they were just less likely to catch it. And then uh, that has somewhat morphed into, well, they catch it, but they just don't get as serious of an illness. Um, the problem is, is, is there have been deaths amongst children including deaths amongst healthy children um, with this virus. Uh, it's rare, very rare, uh, but it's, it has happened. And so um, I don't envy the uh, officials who have to make the tough call about uh, school and the relative uh, risk of uh, getting kids infected with the risk of keeping kids out of, of that very important uh, part of life with school and, and the associated social services and, and food and all that that comes along with it. So that is a, that's a tough one, but, but kids, uh, kids do get the illness. They do spread the illness. have to struggle to find my mute button. I apologize. So um, do we uh, what talk about testing that we offer at uh, Health First Start? Specifically, are we offering um, rapid testing here and kind of what's the pathway for that? Yeah. So the tests, uh, we already talked about the antibody test, which is not that helpful uh, prospectively. It's somewhat interesting retrospectively. Uh, as far as the main types of coronavirus tests, uh, it's, it's basically to it's it's the what I call the brain tickle uh, and the uh, and the uh, uh, antigen test. So so the, the the gold standard right now is called the PCR test, stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's a very accurate uh, test. It go it it involves a swab placed in the far back of the nasopharynx through the nose, and that's why we call it the brain tickle. Uh, Really, it's in the high 90s as far as specificity and sensitivity, meaning if, if it says you got the disease, you got the disease. And if it says you don't have the disease, you very high likely that you don't have the disease with, with few exceptions. Um, and then there's a much easier test, which is just a swab in the front of the nose. And that's called the antigen test. Uh, and it it's uses different technology and it's pretty good. Um, it's, uh, however, it's got it, it's 85% accurate. So 15% of the people who come up negative on the test, uh, excuse me, 15% of, um, people who have the disease will come up negative on their antigen test. And, and we do have both. There's a, a, a advantages because the, the, the brain tickle one, the PCR test, you know, takes several days to get back. And the antigen test is back uh, practically in about an hour. Um, and so that's really nice. And, and, and because if it says you do have the disease, it, that test isn't wrong that way. If it detects the particles, the particles are there. It's only if you have a negative test that you have to be careful because that it can miss a few percent, about 15% of the people who actually do have the disease. So we, we carry both, they're both, uh, they both can be useful. And uh, yeah, that's, that's testing. So then related to that, so this question is, um, yeah, I mean, directly related to testing. So if someone in my family is being tested for COVID-19, does everyone in my family need a quarantine until the test results come back? Not necessarily, and it all depends on why they're being tested. So I would change that concept a little bit. If someone in your family is being tested because 
they have a fever, they're achy, they're, you know, uh, have a headache, sore throat, then yes, everybody ought to basically quarantine and assume that person's infectious. Uh, I mean, if somebody's being tested because their job's requiring it, or, you know, they're being tested just because they're curious or something like that, I, I don't know that everybody has to quarantine. Um, everybody, when they're out, ought to be masked and washing their hands and doing the things that we're all being taught to do. But the answer to that question is based on why are they being tested? If somebody is sick, just assume it's coronavirus and just be safe. Uh, based on your explanation of viruses, how effective will a vaccine be in treating COVID-19 and will it be effective with potential mutations of this virus? Uh, do the second question first. We've got some very smart people working on vaccine development in this country and around the world. Um, well, actually, one of my high school class or high school my medical school classmates married the head vaccine researcher at Duke, and he's working on this and um, just incredibly talented. Incredi you know, it's the kind of guy you want working on a vaccine for America. And um, they're 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 brilliant. What they found out that part of this virus mutates and can change, and part of it doesn't. And so they're making the vaccine based on the part of the virus that doesn't mutate. And that way, no matter how much the other part of the virus mutates, it doesn't matter because you've got antibodies against the static part of the virus. And so they're way ahead of us on this. They've, they've thought that through and it's really nice. And I guess, I'll get on my soapbox just a little bit about vaccination while we're talking about it. Um, clean water and vaccines have saved more lives than any doctor or any surgeon or any hospital or anything like that. You only have to go to the third world to find out that people are still dying today from a lack of clean water and infectious diseases that we long ago quit dying from. And so there is no controversy or there should be no controversy about the benefits of vaccination. Uh, that is all um, pseudoscience. It's wrong. It's we're smarter than that as Americans. And uh, vaccination is incredibly important. Um, by the way, get your flu shots in the next few months. Um, now, this will be a new vaccine. This we, it won't have been studied for years and years and years since the disease just came about. And so uh, you are going to take a small risk when you decide to get uh, vaccinated because it's a fairly new vaccine. We don't know how many doses you'll need. We don't know how effective it'll be necessarily. By then, we'll probably have some idea. And we're thinking early 2021 is when the, the vaccine will come. Now, there's a difference between when the vaccine is approved and available and when you can actually get it in your arm. Uh, you know, we don't know if they're going to give it to first responders first or the military or who, but we all may not be first in line uh, for the vaccine. Um, so anyway, no question that vaccination is the way to go. Uh, Having said that, there will be, uh, uh, you know, it's a new vaccine, so there will be questions when when the vaccines come about. And, and potential mutations? I mean, are we seeing potential mutations in the virus thus far? Yeah, it's some of the labs that have been uh, studying this virus, there have been um, uh, mutations already starting to be seen. But there again, they've got um, they've got ways around that on the on the vaccination. And you know, I don't know this for sure, but that could even explain why people get it twice because you could get a different strain or something that happens with flu and other viruses. Uh, but um, that's why I'll be first in line if I can elbow my way up to the first place to get the shot when it comes out. 
Well, well uh, we hope you, you'll be in that line. It's from a technical, you said get your flu shot. So, I mean, I think I heard somewhere yesterday, and I hope that this was accurate, that you're not going to be able to get your flu shot and your COVID um, vaccine at the same time, right? I mean, there'd have to be some space between them, or do we not know that yet? I don't think we know that yet. So normally you can get multiple vaccines at once. However, you really need to get your flu shot. It's recommended before Halloween. So get it in September, October. Um, it doesn't matter where. It's not even as important which one. There are various flu shots now, and there's pros and cons of various ones. There's there's one for the elderly that has four times the amount of of, re of uh, antigen in it. You know, the important thing is get it. The, which one you get is less important. But yeah, if you're waiting to get your flu shot until when the coronavirus shot comes out, you're waiting too long. Get just. I'm getting mine next week. Just get your flu shot ASAP, and then uh, you won't have to worry about even if if there is a, a problem with getting them together. That's great. That's great. That's really great advice. And so um, we're about out of time. So, Dr. Laird, is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, it's just remember. I think in this country and just in general right now. Um, I think some of some parts of society have lost the fact that we're all Americans. None of us are the enemy. Uh, we are not the enemy. We have enemies in America, uh, outside of America, but none of us are the enemy. We all are have are blessed to be in the greatest country on earth. We actually are blessed to be in one of the greatest uh, states and counties in that country. So we're very blessed to be here. We've got talented people making vaccines. Talented people. Uh, helping us out. All that we're being asked to do is try and limit our spreading of this disease. It's not too much to ask. And uh, we'll all do our best. We all have got to work together. Um, we, we are all part of one family. And um, I have no doubt that Brevard County is well poised uh, to tackle this. This will all be behind us eventually. Um, and uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Well, this has been really great. And uh, Dr. Laird, we're so appreciative um, of your time with us and also your work really on the front lines of this. You, you know, all of our physicians, all of our providers here at Health First and in the region, uh, you know, generally, I mean, you, you've just really charged at this. And so um, as a member of the community, we're, uh, we're in your debt and, and we're just full of gratitude. And, so for the viewers, uh, you know, I just want to say thanks for uh, coming. If we didn't get to your question or if a question occurs to you afterward, you can email those to foundation at hf.org. Um, and um, we, you've got a direct connection to Dr. Laird and his, his uh, great expertise, and we'll get an answer for you. Um, so really, I mean, thank you to everyone for watching. We truly hope this was, um, was helpful and it provided you with some answers. And, and thank you to everybody for continuing to social distance and work masks in public areas. And as Dr. Laird said, we're all in this together and we appreciate you taking the time to join us for this discussion. So thanks everybody. Thank you.